I got recruited starting in about the eighth grade. Mm. I think one of the things I struggled with was like body dysmorphia. I was like, oh wow, I'm getting a lot of muscle. Here we're going four or five hours a day. The fueling is so different and the way that your body changes is astronomical. And I wish somebody would have just brought it to light and said it was okay, you know? The Washington Post came out with this article. They put my picture in there and they mentioned my name. That was the first time I'd ever heard of somebody going out of their way to talk about a young female's body. When I thought that I was struggling, I kind of had to change my mindset. Like, this is gonna give me a new experience. This is gonna change me for the better. Welcome to the Winners Club Podcast. I'm your host, Bryce Wilson, and today I'm here with D1 volleyball player, Alex Glover. Alex, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. So we're gonna get into your mindset and also what it's like being a D1 athlete. But before we do that, I'd like to hear about your journey to become a D1 athlete. So who are you as an athlete growing up? So I was a dual sport athlete. I did track, um, high jump. You know, my dad always preached that putting yourself in different sports kind of made you more well-rounded. Mm. So I was always looking for something else to do. So I did 400 to 200 long jump and high jump growing up. Mm. And eventually once I started getting like deeper into volleyball, I realized it wasn't feasible to be able to do both at the same time for me personally. Mm. So I just did high jump and volleyball in high school. And actually I was really good in high jump. Um, I got second in the state. I think it was my junior year. Super excited about that. But volleyball kind of just took off with recruiting mm. earlier than mm. track did. So I decided to um, go to a bigger club for volleyball. Mm. And I was able to play with girls who were a little bit more competitive mm. than the smaller club that I was from. Mm. So um, I did that. And then I came to SMU early. I graduated high school a semester mm. early. Mm. Since then, mm. I've been here, you know, mm. been grinding for this my fifth year here. Yeah. And I've enjoyed every minute of it. Right. So we'll go back to, to high school. I can see why how high jump and volleyball go together. <laughs> you have some big hops. Yeah. Hops. Uh, so you won the nationals for USA Volleyball and also the MVP. So what do you think led to that? Were you talented or were, did you put in a lot of work outside of your team practice? Yeah, I think that comes back to the point of being more well-rounded. Mm -hmm. Then sometimes it just comes down to more than mm -hmm. just volleyball and just your skill. It's to how competitive you are. Mm -hmm. You know, what's your mindset? Mm -hmm. How do the people around you act? Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, it is a team sport, so it's not just me, you know. Winning that was amazing, but it kind of just showed me from a young age that I cannot play volleyball by mm -hmm. myself, mm -hmm. you know. If we wouldn't have won the USA Championship, um, my 15th year, I wouldn't have been able to get MVP, essentially, mm -hmm. because usually the MVP comes from the winning team. Right. So that really shows how it's such a team sport and mm -hmm. how there's so many components that mm -hmm. go into winning. Okay, so you're a team player, but you, it does sound like you're being humble. Was there still some sacrifices you made outside of just being a normal high school athlete and then also the practice you put in outside of your team practice? Was there things you did outside of that? As far as track, I felt mm -hmm. like that really helped get my agility up mm -hmm. and um, helped me jump higher. Mm -hmm. um, I always did private, so that's a good thing. I was fortunate enough to where, you know, privates and a lot of extra stuff can be expensive to where my parents could make that commitment. My mom and my dad raised me to always be super competitive, to hate mm -hmm. losing more than I loved winning. Yeah. And I think that's a part that helped me succeed so much mm -hmm. because that fear and that pain of losing is like always engraved in the back of my mind. Mm -hmm. I would rather mess up on game point being aggressive mm -hmm. than not being aggressive and lose and mm -hmm. then not put everything out on the right. court. So I think that's something that's driven me mm -hmm. from a young age is just not wanting to lose. Is there a uh, opposite side of that of wanting to, to win or is it more, more the fear of losing and hating to lose that, that drives you? I think obviously everyone wants to win, mm -hmm. but a lot of the time, especially in college, I played a lot of teams where we're evenly matched. Mm -hmm. So it comes down to those extra things, as in how many hours you put in. It comes down to the sleep. It comes down to every single person's mindset on the court and on the bench. There are only six people on the volleyball court, but how loud your teammates are and how they're cheering you on on the sidelines has a big part to do with momentum. Mm -hmm. So every single component has to do with winning that game. So. I think that I know how much it takes. It takes so much to win and to win the right way mm -hmm. that it makes me hate losing that much more because mm -hmm. the loss hurts that much more. All right, one thing. So I told you I did my research. Mm -hmm. You were also homecoming queen. So <laughs> I know this might not relate to being an athlete, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna relate it. So it does show that you were a social, outgoing person. So how do you how are you translate that personality to your team? Like how, how are you as a teammate? Uh, as a teammate, well, I am a team captain this mm -hmm. year. Okay, so. Nice. That's super exciting mm -hmm. that my team voted me that. 
I think that I'm driven, but I'm also a very sociable person. Mm -hmm. And I know the sacrifice that it takes to be a student athlete mm -hmm. and how much, how important it is to have that personal life, to mm -hmm. have friends outside of volleyball, because we're here all of the time. You know, mm -hmm. we're either in the classroom, we're either working out, even if it's not on the court, we're doing weight. Mm -hmm. So there's so much time and so it's so consuming mm -hmm. that you have to have other things outside of volleyball mm -hmm. to be able to stay sane. Right. So knowing that is such an essential part to my success and my team's mm -hmm. success because when you're coming in to volleyball when you're younger, and I fell into this also, volleyball can be the only thing you care about. Mm -hmm. You know, you can let it consume you. Like your performance can be that one factor that makes you have a good day or a bad day. Mm -hmm. And it shouldn't be like that mm -hmm. because sports should bring you joy. And yes, you're going to be upset with, you know, with losses or maybe you didn't perform as well as you could, but there should be other things outside of volleyball that keep you happy and that keep you moving. And that's the only way that you can make it mm -hmm. through these four or five years, you know. Yeah. What are some things that you like to do now that keeps you sane? How do you balance the, the training you have now, what do you like to do in your off days? Definitely sleep because okay, we don't sure. get much yeah. of that. But I have a dog, mm -hmm. so I like to hang out with him. I love to visit my family, mm -hmm. uh, friends, even my teammates. Um, building those relationships offside the court are so important mm -hmm. for what happens on the court. So love to go eat with them mm -hmm. and um, go venture out in Dallas with yeah. them. Let's say on a, on a training day where even when you are busy throughout the whole day, how do you still find little pockets of time here and there to still treat yourself? I definitely find content creation mm -hmm. um, one of my passions. Mm -hmm. And it's so exciting because you have to spend so much time on that to be mm -hmm. good at it. So it's like kind of a little competition for me, but also something that I enjoy. So it doesn't feel like so much of a job. So mm -hmm. I always make sure each day that I'm trying to grow myself in some way mm -hmm. in that. And it's the part of the day that's really the most fun for yeah. me. We'll get into more into that content creation in a second, but let's go back to recruiting. You said the recruiting process was started early. So how was that process? Was it stressful? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so the rules have changed a little bit now, mm -hmm. but um, I got recruited starting in about the eighth grade, mm -hmm. which is, oh. yeah. I mean, to think about it now, you have no clue what you want, right. you know? Like, thank God I chose SMU, and mm -hmm. it's somewhere that I've enjoyed being, and mm -hmm. I love every single aspect of it. But in the eighth grade, you're not thinking the same that you are freshman or sophomore in mm -hmm. college, and that's where you do see a lot of transfers, or you see, you know, coaches leaving, so then you transfer, and it just not being the right fit, which is unfortunate. For me, um, I was just making sure that I got a lot of input from my coaches, from my parents, from people who were older than me that who knew, mm -hmm. you know, sure. I'm in what, 14, 13, I can't yeah. really make mm -hmm. this huge decision yeah. that's going to depict the rest of my future, essentially, you know, when I'm not young. So, mm -hmm. um, but it was super exciting at the same time, like everybody wants to be recruited and wants to be wanted. And mm -hmm. I think that's also one of the factors when you're young that drives you so much because mm -hmm. you want coaches to talk to you. You want to come off as a great teammate because that is a huge component of getting recruited. It's not just how good you are at volleyball. I mean, now being a little bit older and being able to talk to my coaches, sometimes they look to see if it's the right fit with your personality more than they look for the volleyball skill that you have. Mm -hmm. So that is so important when you're young to make sure that you're not a brat, that you're coachable. That's mm -hmm. one of the biggest things ever because a lot of coaches can take the potential that you do have and the skill that you do have and grow that, but they can't change who you are and, you know, where your heart is. So mm -hmm. I thought um, when I was younger, that was a super important part of my recruiting process and making sure that it was a good fit personality wise. Mm -hmm. So when did you actually make that decision? You said you started recruiting in eighth grade, but when did you actually make that decision? I committed to SMU when I was a sophomore. Oh, okay. So I played high school ball my freshman and sophomore year. I did not play my junior and mm -hmm. senior year, continued to play club mm -hmm. and develop that way and do privates and stuff like that. So I think that's one of the big things that my parents taught me and that my coaches taught me that picking a school because of the school mm -hmm. is so important because there's so many moving pieces, especially these days. Like you could commit somewhere with your best friend and then your best friend could transfer or the mm -hmm. coaches could leave or something happens, you know, you get hurt and you still want to love the school as much as you would if you didn't have volleyball. Mm -hmm. So I was glad I made the decision mm -hmm. on choosing SMU because of everything it had to offer along with a great volleyball right. program. All right. So you made a good decision to come to SMU, but how was that first transition on your freshman year? Like we'll talk about off the court and on the court. How was your transition? Ooh, so mm -hmm. it's a big transition. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things I struggled with, and I've talked about this a little bit, was like body dysmorphia. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think in high school, I modeled a lot. I've been modeling since I was four, and that was my job. Like, mm -hmm. I 
would miss a ton of school to do it a couple days a week. And when you're modeling, especially like high fashion runway shows, your body has to look a certain way. And mm -hmm. that was at the time, just the way that my jeans were, how I was built. So it was great. It mm -hmm. was, you know, I was fitting in, I was doing great. And then I got to college mm -hmm. and we had workouts, we mm -hmm. had weights, we had to eat more because in high school and club, you work out what? with your team twice a week, maybe a competition on the weekend. But here we're going four or five hours a day. The fueling is so different and the way that your body changes is mm -hmm. astronomical. And I wish somebody would have just brought it to light and said it was okay, you know, because mm -hmm. having that modeling mindset too, I was like, oh, wow, I'm getting a lot of muscle, which now I've, I've realized that it's so beautiful mm -hmm. and it's so strong and I love the way that I look. But coming in as a freshman, as a, I was 17 when I came in, of course, the social standard and everything I was seeing, my high school teammates and my high school friends, how they were looking. And then I was transforming into this powerful, strong athlete. But at the time, I didn't know what was going on. I didn't, I didn't understand why my body was changing so fast and why I couldn't help it, you know? Mm -hmm. So that made the transition extremely hard. And I had to make sure that I was keeping myself grounded and realizing the bigger purpose you know you have to be strong being a student athlete is extremely hard and you have to have the right nutrition you have to have the right sleep you have to put the right things in your body for you to be able to perform and make sure that you don't get hurt mm -hmm. and i think once i realized that and realized how powerful it is to be a student athlete especially a female then i realized that mm -hmm. it was okay and you know started being more comfortable in my body what are some things that helps you now, like you gave some advice on how you went through that process, but what are some things that help you now deal with um, whatever you may be feeling with that? Is there a certain thing you tell yourself or just understanding that you're an athlete? What helps you? Understanding um, how powerful it, it is to mm -hmm. be an athlete was super important to me and understanding the goals that I had. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be this and still want to be mm -hmm. um, a champion of our conference. I want to be first team all conference and to be these things, you know, I have to be the best mm -hmm. in every single aspect, not just my mental, not mm -hmm. just on the volleyball court. I have to be the best weightlifter that I can be. I have to be the best nutritionist that I can be for myself. Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to do that, then I have to commit to that. Mm -hmm. And it's going to come with changes with my body. And that's okay. And it's beautiful. And there's so many people around me who have empowered me to be this strong, you know, great athlete and beautiful woman along with that. So mm -hmm. I think that understanding the bigger purpose and understanding that it's okay and society is going to change all the time. One time, Guinea's in, the mm -hmm. next month, you know, Pilates is in mm -hmm. and being super toned. And as long as you're comfortable with yourself, then you shouldn't worry about what anybody has to say. On the court, you still performed well despite all the struggles. So what do you think led to you performing well on the court? On the court, I think that the resources mm -hmm. that I have here, um, literally anything, I could go ask, step outside the store and go ask someone right now, um, can I have a dietitian help me with what I need to eat what mm -hmm. exactly? And they will put out that plan. I've had a couple of struggles with my knees and major tweaks like here and there, but I've always had the resources to go. And if I didn't have the help here, they would send me to somebody who was specialized mm -hmm. in that. So I think that the resources is super important at a college and knowing that you have people around you who want to help. Mm -hmm. And I think sadly, that's not the case at all colleges. I think there's a lot of coaches or people surrounded by you who just care about your performance. Mm -hmm. And you have to realize that you're so much more than your performance and you're so much more than even your volleyball career. And once I leave here in six months, I wanna make sure that my body is healthy mm -hmm. and that everything is fine. And I truly believe that here I have all the resources. You performed well enough to now become a captain. So how do you lead your teams? I guess you use your personality, outgoing personality to lead them, but how do you lead your team? I think motivation mm -hmm. is the top one. And then I would say understanding. Mm -hmm. I've met a lot of people um, while playing volleyball that kind of just say volleyball is it, you know, mm -hmm. like you have to come into practice and throw everything else mm -hmm. out, you know, and I just don't think that's feasible for me. There, life happens. Mm -hmm. There's going to be people who have bad days and that's okay. But you have to have self-awareness and say, I'm having a bad day, but I'm going to pick myself out mm -hmm. up out of this. You don't need to say, I'm having a bad day, and once I hit this volleyball gym, mm -hmm. I can't have a bad day anymore. Nothing else is going on around me because that's not, I mean, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So I think understanding is one of my top priorities when it comes to my teammates and trying to hear their perspective because when you come on a team of any sport, 
we're all from different places. We all have different backgrounds and different experiences. And that's what makes us grow throughout the years. But that's also so important for how somebody thinks, you know. Mm -hmm. So you have to under, come from a place of understanding and wanting to hear what another person or teammate wants to say to be able to then lead them. Mm -hmm. Does that mean you're, you're hard on them? You said motivating. Does that mean you're hard mm -hmm. on them? Or do you, like you said, you're more understanding and just like listen to them? How do you, in what way do you motivate them? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say that I'm hard on my teammates, mm -hmm. but I have high expectations. Mm -hmm. I have the same expectations for my teammates as I have for myself. Mm -hmm. And I make mistakes, so they're going to make mistakes too, you know? So that's where the understanding piece comes in. But definitely motivation as in when you step on the court and you're ready to compete, you have so much faith in every single one of your teammates mm -hmm. that you know it's going to work out mm -hmm. regardless. Regardless of the situation or the stats or what happens on the court, I believe in, I have 12 teammates right now, I believe in all 12 of them, whether mm -hmm. they haven't played all season mm -hmm. or they're a starter, you mm -hmm. know, and I treat them with the same respect because yeah. we're all going through different experiences outside of volleyball, but the same experiences in volleyball. Yeah. And that's what helps us grow and makes us kind of fire each other up. Yeah. So you talked about bad days. So are there certain, like I said, on the on the court you perform well. Are there certain things behind the scenes that were tough? Like what was that tough, maybe toughest moment that you dealt with, whether it was from the court or from off the court that you dealt with throughout your career? Definitely the coaching change mm -hmm. has been mm -hmm. the biggest thing that's happened to me within this four years. That's hard to um, see the coaches that recruited you kind of not be here anymore because you don't know how it's going to go. You don't know if the new coaches that come in are going to believe in you the same way. Mm -hmm. You don't know if they're going to not see it as a great fit anymore. Mm -hmm. So that time of just the unknown was so hard for everyone, mm -hmm. you know, even the coaches, mm -hmm. because they're walking into a new team. It's hard to have people to buy in. But mm -hmm. for us to grow and for us to get better, we had to. Mm -hmm. You can't sit here and question the new coaching staff and say, oh, is this what they're doing? Is, is this right? Mm -hmm. um, is the new techniques that they're teaching us, are they going to help us? Because that moment that you have one second of doubt is a moment that you will see failure. Mm -hmm. Everything will go crashing down. So mm -hmm. it was kind of a 50-50 thing. Like mm -hmm. we had to trust in them and they had to trust in us. And yes, we did see a lot of changes on both sides. But when I thought that I was struggling, I kind of had to change my mindset. Mm -hmm. Like this is going to give me a new experience. Mm -hmm. This is going to change me for the better. And mm -hmm. when I graduate, I'm going to know that I can adapt mm -hmm. easier now yeah. that I've had to go through this major change. Yeah. What did that struggle look like? You, sounds like you guys dealt with it and came, came through it, but what did that struggle look like in the moment? In the moment, a lot of tears, <laughs> okay. um, a lot of miscommunications mm -hmm. just because the new coaching staff and the old coaching staff were so different from each other. And it wasn't a great fit for everybody mm -hmm. that was on the team. There were some of my best friends and my teammates that, you know, had to step away from mm -hmm. volleyball or just the team because all the time it isn't that perfect fit and mm -hmm. that's okay. So it was like, okay, now everything around me is changing. My coaches are changing. My teammates are changing. The girl that's my best friend, I was just talking to her and laughing to her. Now she's gone too. Mm -hmm. So it was a lot of being upset, but also trying to ground myself to figure out what is the bigger purpose. Mm -hmm. I still have goals here and I'm still going to continue at SMU and mm -hmm. get my degree and do everything that I wanted to do. How do I do this with all of these new circumstances? Mm -hmm. And throughout this whole period, you started making content and being content creation. So we can talk about that. So when did you start creating content? So part of that modeling mm -hmm. piece mm -hmm. was always having a presence mm -hmm. on Instagram mm -hmm. and TikTok. And then during COVID, as everyone yeah. says, like, I mean, we were all inside. Mm -hmm. So I just started making like day in the lives when I started mm -hmm. coming back to volleyball and they started blowing up and mm -hmm. everybody loved the content I would make with mm -hmm. my teammates. So I saw that and I just kind of ran with it. Mm -hmm. And I still do day in the lives, which is my favorite thing to do ever. Mm -hmm. But uh, content creation is really, I've learned as a passion of mine, especially mm -hmm. having so much time and with NIL being a thing now, I've really learned a lot by myself about myself in content creation. Mm -hmm. It's helped me uh, try to figure out my path for mm -hmm. once I graduate. Yeah. And so in creating content, you have to be authentic and have to be yourself and let people into see your life and everything. So how do you overcome that fear, either making content, putting out there online or just in general, how do you overcome that fear of just being yourself? I think there's some times where I have to find the fine line of every young adult has struggles, mm -hmm. but 
also being a team captain and being in the role that I am, sometimes I am negative with myself. Mm. I cannot bring that negativity online because mm. someone may look at that and they feed off of that, mm. you know? They're gonna be like, okay, yeah, I'm negative too. Mm. That's not what I want at all. So I definitely wanna be real and be myself, but also show the best parts of being a student athlete mm -hmm. because it is so great and so rewarding. So I think that there's finding that balance and I think I've done a better job of it mm -hmm. now as just learning what I like to see in my mm -hmm. videos. And pretty much I just put out content that I would wanna see mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. I wasn't a student athlete, you know, what would I find most interesting? And I find out that most people do wanna see those things that mm -hmm. also I'm most proud of. When you put yourself out there, you leave yourself open to critics and things. So mm -hmm. have you ever dealt with lots of critics online or just again in person? How you deal with those uh, critics? When NIL was first passed, mm -hmm. um, the Washington Post came out with this article mm -hmm. that was talking about our female athletes just sexualizing their bodies to get NIL deals. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time I had ever seen anything like that, especially mm -hmm. with like myself in it. Mm -hmm. I mean, oh, they mentioned yeah. your name or they put your, your picture in there? Yeah, they wow. put my picture wow. in there and they mentioned my name. It was a picture of me doing an ad for Smart Suites mm -hmm. and it was a summertime ad. So I mm -hmm. had done it like by the pool mm -hmm. in a bikini. Mm -hmm. And uh, the comment was that women are now going to be more motivated to kind of promote their body and sexualize their body because mm -hmm. most of the people who Washington Post thought were getting NIL deals had that look, that sexual, you know, mm -hmm. look, which I think is awful. Mm -hmm. But that was the first time I'd ever heard of a somebody going out of their way to talk about a young female's body. Mm -hmm. I think I was 19 mm -hmm. at the time that this came out. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, wow, mm -hmm. I did not realize that people think like this. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I kind of started to see other stuff, you know, mm -hmm. on TikTok, people mm -hmm. commenting under my videos. Mm -hmm. And I just learned to kind of brush it off because mm -hmm. I'm always going to be, I'm going to put myself first. I'm going to be respectful of myself, mm -hmm. my body. And essentially I can put out there what I want to put out there. Mm -hmm. And I always make sure that my personal brand is appropriate mm -hmm. because I know that there are little girls looking at my TikTok, at my Instagram, things that I put out. So I'm never going to put out something that I feel is inappropriate. So if someone else has to comment on it, then, you know, that's on them. They took time out of their day to talk mm -hmm. about it. And that leads to mental health and mindset. So are there any things you do to take care of your mental health? What are some practices you do to take care of your mental health when you're uh, dealing with the struggles? Sometimes I do have to unplug and mm -hmm. just say, you know, I'm not going to make content or I'm not going to be on social media for a couple days. I think that's great for everyone to practice mm -hmm. because social media is so consuming. You mm -hmm. can find yourself comparing yourself to other people in the same positions. If it's not their looks, then it's maybe their stats. If mm -hmm. it's not their stats, then it's maybe their experiences and mm -hmm. what they get to do. And it's it can be really hard. And I think that's one of the hardest struggles of being a young female is comparison. Mm -hmm. You know, there are so many social standards that you try to come up to, but I mean, Social media is fake. Mm. And I'll even say, I love social media. I'm on it all the time. Mm -hmm. I post all the time. Mm -hmm. It's fake. There's mm -hmm. stuff in my days that I'm not going to put in my day in the life. Mm. When I'm posting a picture, I don't look like that 24-7, mm -hmm. you know? And I think it's so important to show people that, you know, and for your mental health and for others' mental mm -hmm. health. Because I think I saw a lot of people on social media growing up that acted like, their life was perfect and I truly believed it. Mm. And that was so hard to grasp for me. Like, how do you have this perfect life? Mm -hmm. And I'm over here struggling over this small issue. Mm -hmm. And it's okay, there's no struggle that is so small or so big that it shouldn't be talked about. So I think part of the mental health piece is being so transparent with yourself mm -hmm. and therefore being transparent with others. And sometimes just letting it out is also amazing. Like mm -hmm. sometimes you just need to say something out loud and then it's gone, yeah. you know, you know, just not holding it in. Are there other things you do outside of social media? So just talking to people, are there you do journaling or anything else else that helps you deal with the mental health struggles? Definitely my trainer mm -hmm. has been a big piece of that. If I have anything that I want to say, um, I can go to her and then taking time out of my day to go outside. Pretty mm -hmm. much every day I go outside with my dog, mm -hmm. breathe in some fresh mm -hmm. air, you know, mm -hmm. just kind of de-stress and always making sure that I have stuff Mm -hmm. to look forward to every mm -hmm. week. So either it's my parents coming or I'm going to go get my nails done or, mm -hmm. you know, something small. Yeah. So yeah. I make sure to add those into my every week life for okay. sure. And one thing I will say, you seem like a confident person, especially 
for you to put yourself out there on social media. So how do you build your confidence? How do you become a confident person? Uh, I think a lot of that is the people around me mm -hmm. and the way that I was brought up when I was younger. My parents always told me, like, you can do anything that you want to do. You can do anything that you don't want to do, you know? Like, your life is up to you. You And they always instilled, like, self-confidence is will bring you a long way. Mm -hmm. You can do so many things just from having self-confidence. Even if you come in a room, I've heard, like, just hold your head up high and act like you know what you're talking mm -hmm. about. And people might actually believe you. Right. So I think that's half of the battle mm -hmm. um, for everything these days is self-confidence. It was a more natural, like, were you always kind of a confident person or did you kind of grow into that? I think I was always kind of mm -hmm. a confident person. Mm -hmm. There definitely, I have my times mm -hmm. where it's like, I'm super down on myself mm -hmm. and I feel like the world is just caving in around me mm -hmm. and I can't do anything right. But I think I've learned to lean on people around me and mm -hmm. I think that helps my confidence so much because I'm not putting all of that pressure on myself. Mm -hmm. Are you hard on yourself after a game? Do you really analyze everything you did and try to improve for the next game? Yes and no. Mm -hmm. I think I'm definitely a person who looks at stats. My undergrad was in engineering, so I'm definitely <laughs> yeah, like an yeah. analytical like mm -hmm. numbers person. Mm -hmm. I like to look at that, but also I have to remember that a lot of stats are situational. Mm -hmm. You know, I could play great against one team and terrible against another, and it's just because the matchups were different. Mm -hmm. So I think that I'm hard on myself, but not to the, not to my fault, not mm -hmm. to where I'm going to dwell on it for days after. And I think if I do have a bad game, getting in the gym is my next step. Mm -hmm. Like that is my biggest motivator mm -hmm. is how I play in games. Okay. Even if I play well, I'm going to get in the gym because I want to play even better mm -hmm. the next game. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a big part of me being hard on myself, but mm -hmm. also giving myself grace because if I do bad, I know for sure that next game is not going to be bad mm -hmm. because I'm going to do everything in my power mm -hmm. that week to make sure that the next game isn't the same. Mm -hmm. So don't dwell on it. Just take action and move forward. How do you maintain that discipline to go back to the gym the next day, even after a bad game? How do you maintain that discipline to keep working out? Being a competitor mm -hmm. and knowing that there's someone right behind me who would love to take my spot. Mm -hmm. Last year, there was a period of time where I was not playing at all. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the time that I grew the most because mm -hmm. I was in the gym and I was going to make sure that I was doing everything in my will to make sure that I made it on the court mm -hmm. at some point when it was my time. Mm -hmm. At the point that I wasn't playing, it wasn't my time and that's okay. But I made sure that when it was my time, I was going to play good and I was going to be the best competitor out there with the mm -hmm. best attitude, the best mindset, and I was going to make sure that my team around me was also going to have that. Mm -hmm. Bring it back to TikTok really quick. So one quick scroll on TikTok shows that dancing is a big part of your life. So um, how do you infuse <laughs> how do you infuse dancing and enthusiasm to uh, your sport, and how do you like just stay enthusiastic and upbeat in your sport? I think that dancing, especially with my teammates, mm -hmm. is something that we've done for years, mm -hmm. and I'm like. I would do it when I'm 17, now I'm 21, I'm yeah. still dancing yeah. to these silly TikTok dances. Mm -hmm. It's just part of having fun. Mm -hmm. um, it is so important to have fun when you're playing volleyball as a student athlete, mm -hmm. because if you're not having fun, then why are you playing? Mm -hmm. You know, there are definitely are times where nobody's having fun. Mm -hmm. But overall, when I look back on these last four years, about to be five, I have fun. Mm -hmm. And that's because I did those silly dances with my teammates, you know? I don't really remember a lot of stuff that happened on the court with, mm -hmm. within these four years. Mm -hmm. I played a lot of games, over what, 120 games now. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you what happened even last year during mm -hmm. a specific game, but I can tell you what happened off the court, yeah. you know? So it's just making sure that I have fun and that mm -hmm. everybody else is having fun around mm -hmm. me. Yeah, what's the importance of having fun, whether in the game or just in life? What's the importance of having fun and not just taking yourself so seriously? I think just thinking about when you graduate, you know, none of the stats are going to matter. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to care if you had 20 kills and mm -hmm. 20 blocks in one game, but you are going to remember the people that you had relationships with. Mm -hmm. You're going to remember how much fun you had on this trip. You're going to remember how this person made you feel. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things that coming towards the end of my career, I want to leave here having the best relationships mm -hmm. with everyone who's here. I want to leave here saying I had the best time at SMU. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad that my college experience went that way because I chose to not take it so seriously. Mm -hmm. I chose to not consume myself in every single game and every single practice. And I chose to venture out and have fun. And I think I would have had a completely different answer 
at the beginning of my career. Mm. I would have said, I want to be a first team all conference. I want to win conference and I want to be a hitter with this kill efficiency mm. and nothing's going to change that. And as I've gotten older, I've realized that is going to be such a small part of my life when I leave here. Mm -hmm. Of course, I would love to achieve those things. But more than that, I want to make sure that I had beautiful relationships and I had fun because college is supposed to be fun. Mm -hmm. We've given some great advice so far. Now we can get into the final five. This is the final five questions I'd like to ask every athlete. So the first one is, what's the misconception about being a D1 athlete? I think a misconception is that it's not year round. Mm -hmm. And I think I even had this misconception, like I thought I would still have a summer break. Mm -mm. <laughs> I'm going to be here training. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, I'll have a Christmas break because mm -mm, mm -hmm. you still have to train at home to make sure that you don't come back, you know, mm -hmm. looking terrible. Mm -hmm. So it is a year round thing. We mm -hmm. don't really get breaks and but it's well deserved, mm -hmm. you know, like when you get on the court, you understand why you can't have those long, lengthy breaks mm -hmm. because what you do during those breaks determine how you play, even if it is nine or 10 months later. Mm -hmm. Second one is, what's the worst experience of your career that you can now look back at as a funny story? It was my first semester that I was here. Mm -hmm. I got a concussion because we were playing med ball volleyball and mm -hmm. it's basically on the sand courts and you just throw like medicine balls. Right. And I was on the team with my strength coach, so of course everybody was throwing the medicine ball at me because mm -hmm. I'm weaker. <laughs> And I caught one of the balls and just slammed my head into the sand. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I didn't realize what a concussion was. I had never had it. Mm -hmm. And two days later was spring break. So I went to spring break with my friends, you know, was having a good time partying mm -hmm. and didn't realize like why I was kind of feeling sick. I was just worried about having a good time with my friends. Mm -hmm. I came back to volleyball the week after and started lifting weights and everything I could not read anything on the wall like it was all blurry mm -hmm. so I was like wait this is weird I went to get tested for a concussion mm -hmm. and I had one mm -hmm. and at this point it had been two weeks <laughs> and it had never been treated mm -hmm. so it was more severe than it would have been if I would have caught it on the front end and I just remember being devastated because I missed my first two spring games ever mm -hmm. of my career mm -hmm. My coaches were obviously very upset at me, like, why did you not bring this to us? Mm -hmm. And young me was just worried about going on spring break. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. So at the time, it was just like everything was coming in on mm -hmm. me. And now I can look back and say, you know what? It was not that deep. Yeah. Like, I missed two games. Now I've played 120 more, exactly. you know? Yeah. Like, those two games did not determine my mm -hmm. whole future. And sure. I understand why they were upset at me at the time. I was like, come on, you yeah. know? Yeah. But I definitely get it now. Yeah, it's temporary, now you moved on. Right. So now, what's the best memory of your career? Um, I think definitely winning our side mm -hmm. of the American Conference was super, like, that is something that I'll remember forever. And I don't think it's because we won. I think it's because I saw how much work went in that year that we won and how far we had come from the beginning of the season to the end of the season. Mm -hmm. And it's just super nice when you have those full circle moments, like, yeah, everything I did paid off. Mm -hmm. So I think that was the best um, time of my career. And what's some advice you give to young athletes that want to be in your position, want to be a D1 athlete? What's some advice you can give them? Definitely work hard would mm -hmm. be my first one, but that's not just physical. Mm -hmm. That's also on your mental, mm -hmm. on your attitude. Attitude is so, por so important. Being coachable is so important. And being well-rounded, mm -hmm. being a well-rounded athlete, don't just... I'm a middle hitter, so I can speak our terms. Mm -hmm. Don't just be a great hitter and a great blocker. Mm -hmm. You know, go and learn how to be a great server and a great defender because those are the things that are going to set you over the top and get you on the court. And don't put yourself in a box of just being a middle hitter because I've seen so many cases where people have come to college and have had to change their position and have had to play something that they've never played before. So I think being able to do all the skills and make sure that you have a positive, great attitude when doing all those mm -hmm. skills is great. Okay, and since you're a pro at it, what's some advice you give to athletes that want to get, learn about NIL deals, um, how you deal with the stress and how you gain them? So yeah, since I have you here in your pro, can you tell us about the NIL deals? I think being super consistent with your content is mm -hmm. so important because your audience is looking at you. They're looking for the next thing all of the time. Mm -hmm. So just trying to capture everything that you want them to see and being true to yourself. Don't change because you want to be like someone else that you've seen online and they've done well. Mm -hmm. Just because someone else is going to do well doesn't mean that you will. Because 
quite frankly, there's already that someone else out there. Why would mm -hmm. they need to come look at your content? Mm -hmm. So trying to make yourself different while always, but while always staying true to yourself. And getting those deals in the beginning is that you contacting brands and companies often. Like, what does that look like? Yeah. So at the beginning, I did a lot of outreach. Mm -hmm. um, so sending emails all day, mm -hmm. uh, pitching myself to brands mm -hmm. and DMs trying to find any type of contact that I could with brands that I wanted to mm -hmm. work with, which was usually brands that mm -hmm. were already incorporated in my life. And then once I started doing NIL deals and started making more of a personal brand of myself mm -hmm. on Instagram and TikTok, I started getting a lot of inbounds. So mm -hmm. now I don't even send any outreach. Mm -hmm. I just get a lot of inbounds in my email. Um, I get a lot in my DMs. I have a manager now that helps me kind of sort out everything and make sure that it's a great fit. Mm -hmm. So I think understanding that sometimes the money is not going to be there, especially when you're first starting out. I think that's a big misconception is mm -hmm. everyone makes so much money from NIL deals. And I think the potential is there to make money. Mm -hmm. But at first, you've got to build a portfolio for yourself. You've got to have the content so that brands believe in you like you believe in yourself. Mm -hmm. So I had to do a lot of gifting opportunities at first. I had to do a lot of $50 deals, you know, mm -hmm. at first. And it takes a lot of time to create great content, but mm -hmm. you've got to take that time because the brand does not want to pay somebody who's not going to really rep their brand great and put out that great content. Mm -hmm. So you've got to make sure that you're on your P's and Q's with editing and your personality and getting the storyline across. Mm -hmm. And I think once you do that and you have a couple of brand deals underneath your belt, you can really start leveraging yourself and how much you're making on NIL. So it is a work, it is a job. <laughs> yeah, it is a job. Mm -hmm. All right, last question is, how do you define the word winner? I think being a winner is being proud of myself. Mm -hmm. um, win or lose, I think that I can be proud of myself in different aspects. I can be proud of the way I fought. I can be proud of the drive that I had. And I think that's what makes me a winner. If I feel accomplished, then I'm a winner. It mm -hmm. doesn't have anything to do with what my coach tells me, what my teammates tell me, what the TV commentators tell me. It has to do with everything that I put in myself and the value I put in myself.